yield point phenomenon. In the following, we will look at a typical material behavior in the tensile test for low carbon steels, as well as for copper and aluminum alloys. Using the example of a flat tensile specimen, we briefly explain the different areas in the recorded stress strain diagram. If the specimen is now loaded, the sample first elongates elastically. This is the range of elastic deformation. When the specimen is stretched beyond the elastic limit, the sample deforms permanently. For some materials, the onset of this plastic deformation is characterized in the stress strain curve by a short drop in stress, followed by a small region of nearly constant stress. Then, the stress must be increased again for further deformation. The specimen necks at the maximum of the curve, which requires a lower stress for further elongation. Finally, at some point the specimen is so severely necked that it fractures. In the present stress strain diagram, the behavior at the onset of plastic deformation appears to be particularly curious. In this case, the specimen stretches without a noticeable increase in stress being required. Such a curious material behavior is also referred to as the yield point phenomenon. The so-called yield strength or yield point refers to the limit stress at the onset of plastic deformation. The cause for the yield point phenomenon lies in the interaction between accumulations of foreign atoms and dislocations. The lattice planes of the dislocations result in widened zones in the area of the dislocation line, also referred to as dilatation zones. In these energetically favorable zones foreign atoms are preferably deposited, whose accumulations are also called Cottrell atmospheres. These foreign atoms first prevent the dislocations from moving due to their electrostatic forces. This is also referred to as pinning of dislocations. Only at a certain stress, the dislocations can break away from the foreign atoms and the plastic deformation process suddenly begins. Once the dislocations have finally come loose, they only have to be kept moving with less effort. This is accompanied by a reduced force and the stress drops briefly. Only when the dislocations encounter other obstacles will they be pinned again. This explains the sharp drop in stress at first and the zigzag-shaped course of the stress strain curve. Only when the dislocations have moved through the microstructure and are no longer pinned by Cottrell atmospheres does the stress have to be increased again due to strain hardening in order to achieve further elongation. The region in the diagram between the onset of plastic deformation and strain hardening is referred to as yield point elongation or looter strain. The dislocations emerging on the surface of the specimen during yield point elongation result in so-called slip steps. Since the reflections change at these microscopic distortions, these slip steps can be seen as a matte, stripe-shaped mesh on the shiny surface of a flat specimen. These stretcher strain marks on the surface are also called looter bands, which often run at an angle of about 45 degrees to the tensile axis, since at this angle the shear stresses in the slip planes become maximum. In general stretcher strain marks are undesirable in forming technology because they result in an unsightly surface. The looter strain does not occur uniformly over the entire gauge length of the sample but gradually moves from top to bottom or vice versa. This can be seen during the tensile test by the successive looter bands, which only gradually cover the entire tensile specimen. The yield point elongation is therefore an inhomogeneous plastic deformation. Once the specimen has been stretched beyond the looter strain, the yield point phenomenon no longer occurs after the specimen has been unloaded and the tensile test has been repeated in a timely manner. This is because the dislocations have already detached from the Cottrell atmospheres and are therefore free to move anyway. The elastic deformation then continuously changes into plastic deformation without yield point elongation and the associated formation of stretcher strain marks. For this reason, deep drawing sheets, which would normally show a yield point phenomenon, are often plastically deformed in advance by rolling. This prevents litter strain and thus the formation of stretcher strain marks during subsequent deep drawing. Due to diffusion processes, however, foreign atom accumulations can form again over time, which lead to Cottrell atmospheres. This process is called aging. In such a case of aging, a yield point phenomenon occurs again. Moreover, a yield point phenomenon only occurs at relatively low temperatures. At high temperatures this phenomenon disappears and the stress increases continuously with increasing strain. The reason for this is the diffusion of foreign atoms, which increases strongly at higher temperatures. 
If the diffusion rate is much higher than the dislocation motion, then no foreign atoms can accumulate to form Cottrell atmospheres in the first place due to the strong lattice oscillations. Thus, without the Cottrell clusters, the dislocations are free to move and no yield point phenomenon occurs. A special case arises when the diffusion rate is approximately equal to the speed of the dislocation. Then the dislocations must break away from the Cottrell clusters, but are recaptured by the post-diffusing foreign atoms before they must break away again. This is noticeable in the stress-strain diagram as an increasing zigzag course of the curve. Such phenomenon is also called Portovan Le Chatelier effect. We hope you enjoyed the video and found it helpful. Thanks for watching.